There are exactly five players that are most critical to producing a winning season for the Washington Commanders, and I'm going to tell you who they are, that and more coming up on this episode of Locked On Commanders. Your daily podcast on the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to this Monday episode of Locked On Commanders, your daily podcast covering the Washington Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget, you can subscribe for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, and you can continue the conversation over on subtext at joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Commanders, where you can go one-on-one with me because I'm your host, David Harrison, D Harrison 82 on Twitter, credential member of the media and Washington Commanders beat reporter for Commander Country Sports Illustrated's fan nation site covering the Commanders. Here with you Monday through Friday, along with our everydayers. And as always, I appreciate your continued support for the show. On today's episode of Locked On Commanders, we're going to discuss a first-time occurrence this preseason under head coach Ron Rivera, and we're going to identify the five most important commanders this year. And this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. We're going to start off today's episode counting down the five commanders that are most important to a successful season, starting with number five. And number five is safety, Derek Forrest. Forrest played more snaps as a traditional cover free safety in 2022 than any other commander's defender did, according to PFF.com. And the commanders this season have four games against the Eagles and Cowboys alone, and two of their receivers were top 10 in the league last year when it came to targets coming 20-plus yards down the field. So targets 20 or more, deep ball uh, threats. Coming from the Philadelphia Eagles and the Dallas Cowboys, A.J. Brown of the Philadelphia Eagles had 35 of them. That was tied for third in the NFL. And C.D. Lamb of the Dallas Cowboys had 29 of them, which was ninth in the NFL. But it doesn't just stop there. So that's four games that you're going to face those two receivers, and you're going to face two of the top 10 deep ball targeted receivers in the National Football League from a year ago. But we're adding to that list. Number one overall, 39 deep targets, Tyreek Hill of the Miami Dolphins. Stephon Diggs of the Buffalo Bills came in tied for third with A.J. Brown with 35. Then you have Gabriel Davis, again, of the Buffalo Bills, coming in sixth place with 31 of them. So between Diggs and Davis, you're talking 66 combined deep ball targets for for just those two guys. D.J. Moore of the Chicago Bears had 30 last year, which tied for seventh in the National Football League. Now, that was with the Carolina Panthers, but I think we should expect the Chicago Bears to try and use D.J. Moore as a deep threat as well. And then Alan Lazard of the New York Jets had 28 last year, which was 10th. So right at the rim uh, of the top 10. Now, again, he was with the Green Bay Packers when he had those deep ball targets, but he was also with quarterback Aaron Rodgers. Quarterback Aaron Rodgers is with the New York Jets. So Alan Lazard, uh, and by the way, the offensive coordinator that was coaching Aaron Rodgers and Alan Lazard before last season, uh, also in New York. So fully expect that to be basically replicated. Now that's nine games this season where a top 10 receiver and deep deep ball targets from last year is going to be facing this Washington Commanders secondary. So obviously the cornerbacks are going to have their uh, work cut out for them, but that also makes that deep center fielder free safety uh, incredibly important, especially in a traditional zone coverage scheme where Derek Forrest usually patrols the deep part of the field. So super important for Derek Forrest to step up, especially in those nine games. I mean, if Derek Forrest just kind of falls off during those nine games, you can probably chalk those up. Uh, as nine losses. Now, the good news for Washington is that Forrest was the 13th highest graded safety last year in zone coverage in 2022, which is uh, what he was doing 322 times compared to 104 times he was in man coverage. So the very large majority of the time he was in zone. He was the 13th best safety last year uh, doing so. And hopefully this year he's going to take even more steps forward in his continued development, his career. Uh, Now, the next player. So that's our number five player. And again, There's a lot of players on this team, so this is not intended to say none of the other guys are important, but we just had to narrow this down to a top five so that we can framework it within the confines of the show. So again, no no shade to guys like Cameron Curl or Kendall Fuller or Benjamin St. Juice or or anybody else. We're just trying to isolate kind of the most important players specifically for different reasons. So that was number five, safety Derek Forrest. Number four is going to be running back Brian Robinson. Top five winning quarterbacks in their second year starting since 2000. So 
a lot going on here, right? What I did is I, I took, I went to Pro Football uh, Reference and I sorted all the data to give me second year quarterbacks, the most successful. So the most wins in a second season by an NFL quarterback since the year 2000. Now, some of those quarterbacks started their rookie seasons and then had successful second seasons. Some of them, the second season was their first season. Obviously, we know Sam Howell had one game last year as a rookie. This year, his second NFL season will be his first as a full-time starter, assuming uh, that he's able to keep a grip on that job. So now we have the parameters set, right? The top five winning quarterbacks since 2000 in their second seasons in the NFL. Lamar Jackson is the uh, Lamar Jackson tied for first place, rather 13 wins in 2019 with the Baltimore Ravens. Now, what's what I kind of went looking for is the support structure around these quarterbacks, right? Because that's basically what Sam Howell is going to need to rely on. Running back Mark Ingram in 2019 was 13th in total offense among running backs in the NFL. Uh, that year, helping out Lamar Jackson in his second season. The Baltimore Ravens defense, third in scoring. Number two quarterback tied for first technically. Again, 13 wins. This time, it's Russell Wilson from the 2013 Seattle Seahawks team. Running back Marshawn Lynch was the sixth player uh, that year from scrimmage, uh, offensive yards production from scrimmage. And then their defense in Seattle was the top scoring defense in the NFL. Here's really the anomaly. And of course, he's the anomaly for a lot of different reasons. But the third quarterback, 12 wins, Patrick Mahomes, 2018 Kansas City Chiefs, his second season in the NFL, his first year uh, as a starter. Running back Kareem Hunt, 13th in the NFL, uh, yards per scrimmage from or from scrimmage for a running back. And then his defense was actually the 24th uh, scoring defense. So not very good defense there in Kansas City. But Patrick Mahomes and Kareem Hunt and some of his other players we'll talk about later, helping that 2018 Chiefs team still get 12 wins. Number four, Teddy Bridgewater, 11 wins for the 2015 Minnesota Vikings. Adrian Peterson was his running back, the top player from scrimmage uh, and offensive yards from scrimmage. His defense in Minnesota was the fifth-ranked scoring defense that year as well. Jared Goff finishes off the top five, 11 wins in 2017 with the Los Angeles Rams. Running back Todd Gurley was the number one running back in yards from scrimmage, uh, scrimmage and his defense was the 12th-ranked scoring defense. So what the trend is here outside of Patrick Mahomes, right? And Patrick Mahomes, again, is the trend breaker for a lot of things. But the trend you're seeing here is you need a top 12, top 13 running back in yards from scrimmage. And you're also going to need yourself a top five, top 10 defense in scoring. Last year, Antonio Gibson was the 33rd ranked running back in total yards from scrimmage. Brian Robinson was the 35th. Brian Robinson, I expect to take that full step in as the number one back. Obviously, Antonio Gibson is still going to get his burn. I've already said every day, as you've already heard it, I actually think Antonio Gibson really kind of fits the Eric Bieniemy style coming from Kansas City more than Brian Robinson does. But Brian Robinson fits more of what Eric Bieniemy style was and the style he was coaching when he first entered the NFL. So it's going to be interesting to see how those styles contrast. And honestly, this could be a group effort. Antonio Gibson, Brian Robinson, maybe they combine for top 10, top 12 uh, yards from scrimmage production. And that's perfectly fine, too. But Brian Robinson expect to be the number one guy. So he's the name. Uh, that I'm going to put here. Last year, scoring defense for Washington, seventh in the NFL. So keep that or do even better, and you give Sam Howell a great chance, and you give the Washington Commanders a great chance to be successful in 2023. That's why Brian Robinson is player number four in the five most critical players for the Washington Commanders to have success this season. That's two down, three to go in our top five. Those are coming up next here on today's episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team. Every day. In today's episode of Locked On Commanders is brought to you by FanDuel. Make a fast break to FanDuel during the NBA playoffs because right now, new customers can get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. The Denver Nuggets are up three games to none over the Los Angeles Lakers after Saturday's double digit win in Los Angeles. Uh, and they are three and a half point underdogs in game four. Monday night. I've already put my money on the Nuggets to cover that spread and most likely win that game. But a win for the Lakers would make it 3 1 in favor of the Nuggets. Currently, Los Angeles has plus 1,700 odds to do what no NBA team has ever done and come back down from or come back from being down 3 0. So if you think there's a chance that LeBron James and the Lakers make that history, then you could win $85 on a $5 bet. Right now, if you still bet on them to win the Western Conference Finals, no matter what you bet, there's no better place to bet on all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. 
That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Continuing on with today's episode of Locked On Commanders. Thanks again for making Locked On Commanders your first listen or view today and every day. Every day is come back tomorrow. Our weekly mailbag episode dropping at 11 a.m. Eastern on YouTube. And if you've got questions you want to get in for that episode, just put them down here in the live chat comments. Or you can email or text them to me as well. Three more critical commanders uh, to go for the Washington Commanders who have a successful 2023 NFL campaign. And we're going to pick this up with our top defender. We already talked about safety, Derek Forrest. We got to bring in number three defensive tackle, Jonathan Allen. And just to put this simply, look, I think the defense is going to have to be probably the star of this team, right? Again, we talked about last year, the seventh team uh, in scoring defense in the National Football League. They're going to need a similar type performance. I think that's why you see such a heavy commitment and investment in the defense. You see the contract to Deron Payne and then the first two draft picks spent on defensive backs. I think there's a reason for it. Young quarterback, you typically need to make sure you can kind of take control of games on both sides of the line of scrimmage and ensure that if your offense isn't putting up a whole lot of points, your defense also isn't giving up a lot of points. And really for me, from an emotional leadership standpoint, that's going to start and end with Jonathan Allen. And and that's why he is the main defensive catalyst for this team. Deron Payne, this is going to be his first year under his new deal. So there's going to be some questions and we're not really out here talking about it a lot right now. But we all kind of know if Deron Payne gets off to a slow start or if he's seen loafing here and there, there's going to be a lot of backlash to me, a lot of conversations. I'm hoping and I don't expect that to be a problem and I don't expect that to be a thing. But again, if anybody, whether it's Deron Payne, whether it's Derek Forrest, whether it's anybody becomes, I don't say a problem, but starts to kind of play with maybe a little bit less heat uh, than you want to see them playing with, John Allen is going to be the leader that people look to to get that guy back on track and make sure that he's playing for the pride of himself, for the pride of his family, but also for the pride of his team. Uh, it's important to control the line of scrimmage as well. So, so Jonathan Allen, not only a leader on the team, obviously a captain, but also uh, someone who can help the Washington Commanders control the trenches, win in the trenches. Uh, and again, if you're good in the trenches, it's really hard to be a bad team. But if you're bad in the trenches, it's really hard to be a good team. Uh, and Jonathan Allen is going to be that key catalyst while they figure out the future of their defensive end position because – Beyond this year, there's a lot of question marks going on there. So if those issues aren't there, the defensive tackle spot, then uh, the defensive ends can do their thing, kind of show what they're worth. But he's not just a leader, right? There's also importance to himself and his own personal game. But the 2022 Commanders defense, 16th in rushing yards per play. It's about average. That's about, you know, that's that's fine. It's not bad. It's not great. Uh, you can live with that. You're not going to die with that. Sixth in sacks per pass. That's pretty stinking good. And the best third down defense in the NFL, but his personal impact as well. 11th run grade, uh, according to PFF, among defensive tackles with 300 or more run defense snaps. Eighth in tackles, only had four missed tackles logged by Pro Football Focus, and he was the second best or had the second best stop percentage, uh, which for those unfamiliar, that means he made plays that resulted in failed third downs, things that basically created offensive failures. Jonathan Allen, the second best stop percentage in the NFL among defense tackles. Again, with at least 300 snaps against the run. Best average depth of tackle as well, with 1.3 yards being his average. So usually when he's making a tackle, the opposing offense is only getting an average of 1.3 yards. Deron Payne came in third place with 1.6. So very solid up the middle unit. Again, very good players up front, but I think Jonathan Allen, the most important. That's why he gets the nod as our number three guy. Our number two most critical commander for this team to have success in 2023 might be a little surprising because I think you all probably expected me to put him number one, but as quarterback, Sam Howell, he is the second number. He's the second guy. Why? Because not only is he kind of replaceable, there's already kind of a plan to replace him. If things don't go well, the commanders already have a safety net in place. That is Jacoby Brissett. It's always smart to have a really good backup. I'll never doubt a team for having a really good backup, but let's just be honest here. This team has a really good backup because there's a reason that they might need to use them, right? Now, going back to all those successful second-year quarterbacks and their run game or defensive support that they have, uh, again, it's not meant to say that it's going to be all on the running backs, all on the defense or anything like that. The quarterbacks certainly contributed, and here's what those quarterbacks contribute. Lamar Jackson in 2019, 66.1% completion percentage, 3,100 yards, 36 touchdowns, six interceptions. Russell Wilson, 63% completion percentage, 3,300 yards, 26 touchdowns, Nine interceptions. Patrick Mahomes, 
the unicorn. 66% completion percentage, 5,000 yards passing, 50 touchdown passes, and 12 interceptions. Man, that season was wild. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater in 2015, 65.3% completion rate, 3,200 yards, 14 touchdowns, 9 interceptions. Jared Goff, 62.1% completion rate, 3,800 yards, 28 touchdowns, 7 interceptions. So outside of the anomaly that is Patrick Mahomes, the middle ground there is right around 64.2 completion percentage, 3,300 yards, 27 touchdowns, and 8 interceptions. That's a 6.1% touchdown pass ratio and a 1.8% interception pass ratio. Of course, those were 16-game seasons. So if we extrapolate that data to 17 games, you're looking for 296 of 461, 3,500 yards, almost 3,600 yards, 28 touchdowns, 9 interceptions for Sam Howell. That would be a solid second season, a starting season for a second-year quarterback that would help this Washington Commanders team find success. So on a per-game basis, right? That's a lot of math. I know that. But on a per-game basis, here's about what you want to see from Sam Howell to say that he is doing enough, quote-unquote, when you look at the historical examples since the 2000s of quarterbacks that are successful in their second year, we're talking 10, 11, 12, 13 wins, 18 for 28 per game. Like This is a per game basis, 18 for 28. If he's 18 for 28, he's basically on par. Anything better, he's up, he's coming in ahead of strokes. Anything worse, then we're talking about bogey land, right? 212 yards passing. That seems like a pretty reasonable uh, benchmark. 1.6 touchdowns per game. Obviously, you can't get 0.6 touchdowns per game. So we're looking at about four touchdown passes every three games and then half an interception a game. So no more than one every two games. I think that's a fairly reasonable mark uh, to ask a quarterback to get to in year two uh, to show that you can be a franchise leader. It, uh, is it better if Howell is successful for the team? Obviously, yes, you want Howell to be successful, but the team can get those same numbers. Like If I were to tell you that Jacob Brissett has to get, come in and get those numbers, can he get those numbers? Yes, I do believe that he can get those numbers. So quarterback's the biggest position, the most important position, so we still put the quarterback position up there on a pedestal. But because there is a veteran backup option to go to if Sam Howell falters, that's why Sam Howell is number two on this list. Instead of number one, and number one is Terry McLaurin. Scary Terry, irreplaceable. Bottom line, I love Jahan Dotson. I'm a big fan of Curtis Samuel. They are not number one wide receivers right now. John Dotson certainly has that potential. Curtis Samuel, I think he's kind of going to kind of going to kind of always be a little bit of a role player, number two guy, a trick guy, a gadget guy, and there's nothing wrong with that. But Terry McLaurin is your undoubted, undisputed number one wide receiver, uh, and there's no replacing him. If he's not on the field, you're just you're just going to you're just dropping. You're dropping in talent, right? 11 wins would be good this year for the Washington Commanders. I think 11 wins would make a lot of people very happy, but the quarterbacks had the most success. 12, 13 wins on that list that we just talked about. All of them had something in common, and that was their primary target who had more than a dozen or more targets than the next guy behind them. So 12 or more targets in the second person. These young quarterbacks in their second years, Russell Wilson in his second year, Lamar Jackson in his second year, Patrick Mahomes in his second year, they all had a guy that more than 12 times compared to the second guy they targeted uh, the batch of the time McLaurin last year, 13 more targets than Curtis Samuel had in 2022. So he fits that bill already. And he had a 64.2% catch radius, which is about on target with what those young quarterbacks had before him. So he's obviously familiar with this role. Now he just needs to carve it out with one more quarterback, his 10th starting quarterback, by the way, he started week 18. So in four seasons, Terry McLaurin has had 10 different starting quarterbacks. Now that 10th quarterback is going with him into year five. So we'll see if they can uh, make this magic happen without Terry or even a good relationship working with Terry on the field. The commander's offense gets a lot more simplistic and it's a lot harder for Sam Howell to hit those numbers for Brian Robinson, Antonio Gibson, or a combination of the two to give them the support they need. And that defense is going to be on the field a lot more, which is going to be hard for them to keep uh, that scoring average down. Good news is the one game that they had together, McLaurin had six targets, three catches, 74 yards, and a touchdown. Not a bad start by any means. Speaking of good starts, the Washington Commanders have made a good decision, and that could help get their regular season off to a better start by doing something that they have not done since Ron Rivera arrived. That's next here on today's episode of Locked On Commanders.
wrap it up today's Monday episode of Locked On Mirrors. Talking about something that Coach Rivera is doing this year that he has never done before in Washington. And that is joint practices during training camp. The Washington Commanders and the Baltimore Ravens, according to multiple reports, are going to be conducting joint practices this preseason. It'll be the first joint practice session held by the Commanders since Ron Rivera's arrival back in 2020. Joint practices have honestly become very, very popular around the National Football League. Uh, and most recently, just last season, Tampa Bay Buccaneers actually had two joint practice sessions. They traveled to Tennessee, had joint practices with the Titans, and then they had the Miami Dolphins in Tampa and did joint practices with the Dolphins uh, prior to those two preseason games. The practices are honestly, they provide a better opportunity for teams to get reps in. And every single player that I've ever talked to about joint practices, they always say that the thing they like about them is that you're lining up against someone who doesn't care about your well-being. They're, they're not worried about your success. They're not worried about how well you're being trained. They're out there to make you look foolish, and they know that you're out there to do the same. It's legitimate competition, even though there are still some practice parameters. But they do tend to be a little bit more physical, right? They test the metal of teams early. They provide the opportunity to find out if you have some fight back, because usually day one, there's kind of like one side or the other that comes away winners. And then day two, you want to find out if the losers from day one come out fighting and come out looking to compete to be the winners for day two. This also allows teams to work, though, on more install type things because this isn't nationally broadcast. It's not recorded and put up on NFL.com or NFL Plus or anything like that. There are fans in the stands, so sometimes uh, some video recording, some cell phone footage. Uh, gets out that they don't necessarily want to get out. But for the most part, you can put in more install. You can do more things that you're going to do in the regular season because, again, this isn't broadcast, and you're playing against teams in the preseason that you're not going to play in the regular season, and it's usually AFC versus NFC because, again, you're not seeing them in the regular season, and you're not going to see them in the playoffs unless you make it to the Super Bowl. By the time you get to the Super Bowl, the things you've installed in August together, those things would be completely different, and you know there's just a whole lot more. Uh, time in between so you're not really worried about a plus you're the super bowl so it's pretty much all good uh at that point from a quarterback standpoint coaches love this and quarterbacks love this because you get live defenses you actually have to read you actually have to react you don't see these guys every single day you don't know well you know benjamin st juice usually gets caught on this double move by curtis samuel no you're going up against a defense that you haven't necessarily seen before and then you come in the next day you do some film so you have an opportunity to kind of read uh and react but Still no contact allowed with the quarterback. So that makes the coaches happy uh, and it makes the quarterbacks happy because, of course, they like staying healthy. And the fans in attendance look forward to big plays, bragging rights, and fights. I mean, look, both coaches are going to say, we told our guys not to fight. We don't want any fighting. Da, 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 da. There's going to be at least a scuffle or two. You can pretty much guarantee it. Uh, the two will do the two teams, the Ravens and the Commanders, will have these joint practices in Baltimore at their facility, from my understanding. And then they will later play the game at FedEx Stadium in Landover, Maryland. So a little, that's a little bit different, right? But because the two teams are so geographically co-located, uh, Baltimore is closer to FedEx than uh, Ashburn is. So I suppose it makes sense. And the facilities are probably just a little bit better, a little bit better. Something for the new owners to uh, to consider is your team being able to host joint practices. That would be, that would be a plus. Coming up tomorrow, we've got our mailbag episode. That'll be dropping at 11 a.m. Eastern time. So be sure to come back for that. If you've got questions to submit, just throw them in the live chat, YouTube comments, on Twitter, email uh, at LockedOnCommanders at gmail.com, or you can hit me up on subtext. As always, I want to thank you for making Locked On Commanders your first listen of the day, every day, every day. Thank you for coming through on a consistent basis like you do. And remember, you can continue the conversation with me over at joinsubtext.com slash locked on commanders. Thank you so much for making me part of your day, part of your routine. And if you have anything else Washington Commanders related you want to know or you want to discuss, make sure you're also following me on Twitter at dharrison82. Until we speak again, be safe, be kind, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Locked On Commanders, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.